Check one, two, one, two. I thought I'd start just a little bit early today. Actually, it's not that early. It's just hit 11 a.m. anyway, because I have a new microphone. It's a very high quality microphone. So COM1511 is now in ASMR. If you want to take your programming really, really personally, we can get it really personal. Anyway. <laughs> Hi everyone, uh, <laughs> welcome to Comp1511 coming from a different time, a different place in space and time. Uh, <laughs> um, just to let everyone know, um, hope that everyone who is not currently in New South Wales in Australia uh, made it to the lecture today because we are... Um, uh, we have just switched into daylight savings time, which means the lecture starts an hour earlier than it would have previously. Hello, lecturer in charge has just turned up to say hello. I think she's just going to plonk herself on my lap for the moment. Um, looking at how many people we have right now, I think we're a little bit lower than we would usually be for our first, um, uh, for the start of the lecture, but we'll see how we go with that. Um, also, uh, if there are any problems with audio, please let me know because um, I've just set up a new microphone. It is sig significantly more expensive than the microphone that I was using before, so hopefully the sound quality is a lot better. So a couple of questions that we've got at the beginning. Uh, Dan was saying, wait, do we have an assignment this week? Yes, the assignment was released uh, two days ago. So it was released on Sunday. Don't worry, you haven't missed anything yet. Um, uh, but there is a little bit new, a little bit of new stuff that's happening this week um, because we're sort of ramping up into uh, Comp One Five One One at its sort of regular intensity. So we now have an assignment to work on in the background as well as the labs and the weekly tests that you'll be doing uh, normally. Um, hopefully, everything that we're doing in terms of assignment lab and weekly tests, it all sort of rolls into the same thing in a sense that um, the assignment won't necessarily be asking you to do things that you don't understand about, it should be testing you on things that we've taught you. Um, we won't know everything about what we need to do for the assignment until the end of this week. So there's still some content in the um, in the lectures that are that is going to be reasonably necessary for the assignment. So you can look at the assignment now if you're super keen. You can start thinking about the assignment. But if you see anything in there that just looks like I have no idea what's going on there, uh, chances are that's because it's something that's going to be covered maybe today. Um, in fact, I think it is actually just today. And when I think about my lecture plan, Friday's lecture does not necessarily have anything that's needed for the assignment. Um, on Thursday, I will be doing a bonus live stream, which is, I mean, like, you know, all the lectures are live streamed, but the, the lectures are me delivering content to you, whereas the live stream is much more interactive. I'll spend more time talking to chat and it's not as structured. So Thursday is going to be, you've had four days to, to read the assignment spec, have a look into it, maybe try some code. I mean, some people are going to launch right in and start working on it. That's cool. Um, the Thursday will be a lot of like Q and A. If people have any initial questions about the assignment, um, I will also have a, a short section, maybe half an hour, forty-five minutes, that I'll go through on Thursday, saying this is how. Um, uh, this is how the, the rough idea of the assignment works. I'm not going to be saying, this is how to solve the assignment. The technical side of thing is like, okay, just use everything that I've taught you. But this is like, okay, this is how we're gonna mark it. Um, this is how I think you should approach it. Um, here are some ideas about um, um, how to do what you do in the assignment, that kind of thing. Um, People are talking about the hour early. Oh, Numit is here at 5 a.m. I, I am sorry for you. That's that's really, that's really tough. I mean, at least the one thing that you know is that the the lecture is always fully recorded. 
um, and there's nothing that you're going to miss out on, unless of course you want to ask questions. So there's still still some stuff that you're going to going to need. Uh, Rosie's asking if the Thursday lecture will be recorded. Thursday live stream is definitely recorded. It will go up in amongst all of these lectures as just an extra lecture. Um, Apaco's asking, are we going to talk about the assignment? That's as much as I'm going to say about the assignment today. Today's dedicated to content, but Thursday's dedicated to the assignment. So Thursday will have a whole thing about the assignment. Because I consider the, like, you know, if I talk about stuff that's specific to the assignment, but not necessary for learning the course, like not, not the content for the course, then I want it separate from the lectures. So that when you're, say, going back through and studying and you want to watch the content that you need, you can skip that one because that one's like prep for the assignment. But you would watch all of these because these are content for the course. So it's slightly separating content that way, even though everything is technically a live stream. Okay, <laughs> 8 a.m. For, for Anson there. So a couple of people, it's early. Um... Izzy's asking, if we can't make the live stream, can we watch a recording? Yes, you can. Uh, the assignment due date, as people are saying, 25th of October. It'll be exactly three weeks from after the assignment was released. Uh, Nora, the lecture on Thursday, the, the live stream on Thursday is in t at 2 p.m. So I picked a spot where there are no Comp 1511 um, labs and also had a look and only, I think, less than 10% of the course officially from what I can see of timetables, is committed to something else at that point in time. All right, let's launch into the lecture itself. A little bit of housekeeping, housekeeping out of the way there. Oh, the other thing I forgot to mention, uh, help sessions are starting this week. So help sessions are points where you can get one-on-one -on -one help uh, from a tutor by joining in a session. It's a little bit like your tutorials, Blackboard Collaborate session at specific times during the week. Um, and... Uh, you can get some one-on-one -on -one time with a tutor, you can show them some code and talk to them about specific um, issues that you're having. These will be running from now until the end of the term because what we find is that when people have assignments to do, uh, we find that more often people need, need a bit of one-on-one. -on -one. So when you're working on your assignment and you get stuck and you're like really deep in a hole, you don't know how to debug or anything like that, help sessions can be good for those. For those. The thing that we see that tends to happen is that the closer to the assignment deadline it is, the busier the help sessions get and the longer it takes to get seen by a tutor because we don't have necessarily enough tutors to get like instant one-on-one -on -one feedback for every student because the, the numbers just don't work out like that. Um, so I think it's, as always, it's better to start earlier than later on the assignments. It's gonna take you the same amount of time to do the assignment, no matter when you do it. So earlier is better than later because that's when all the help's available and less people tend to be working on the assignment. I know, I know when I say that, there's a bunch of you who are like, ha, I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna start the assignment exactly three hours before it's due and just smash this thing out as fast as I can and hand it in. Okay, that happens. I know it happens. So it's 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 not that big a deal. It's just like regular for students to to always be like, ah, oh, I'll, I'll get there just in time. And I know because I do that as well with a lot of my work. But um, if you can, if you can swing it, um, starting earlier is is often better than starting later. Not necessarily starting before I've finished all the lectures to teach you about what you need to do for the assignment, but um, but still. Starting early is good. Um, oh, Rosie, you have an, a, a lec lab at that time. Sorry, I don't. Yeah, you you must be one of the one of the people because I I saw that it was about thirty or forty people who had something on. Um, I mean, hopefully you can watch it afterwards and still get some useful information. Uh, Amex is asking about the assignment prep. Uh, so if anyone needs to know about the, um, the assignment prep, it's actually in the lecture section of our web CMS. So the live link to find it there is there. I haven't put any slides up yet for it because I, I haven't made them yet. Um, but I will make a short set of slides at least to talk about. Um, okay, let's launch into it. So... What did we learn last week? We were looking at code style and code reviews. We are looking at what it takes to make our code understandable um, 
for ourselves and for other people, makes it quicker for us to find problems and solve them and things like that. We also looked at two technical things, functions and arrays. Um, functions are our ability to write separate bits of code and name those separate bits of code and run them whenever we want to. And it means that that separate bit of code can be run multiple times. Um, it also means that if we have something weird and different, we can put it in its own little category so that in the flow of our code just has do this, then do this, then do this. And the details of what we do is packaged somewhere else. We're going to talk more about that today. Um, we also talked about arrays. Arrays were our ability to collect multiple variables together. So um, if we had, like we were doing multiple players in a game and we wanted to store all their scores together, it makes it a little bit easier um, for us to have a series of numbers together that we could loop through and check all of them. Or if we wanted to, we could loop through and add them all up. Little things like that. Today, we are continuing our work on functions and arrays. So, I mean, I could say that there's no new content for today, but there is kind of, because we're expanding both functions and arrays to learn a little bit about um, some more depth in what they have and a little more nuance of what they do. Um, I realized here that I put a third dot point in functions and libraries. I think this is the last minute change that I was doing last night. Um, I'll talk about that later. It's actually, it's it's in there. It's, it's something we're going to talk about of like some subtleties of how functions work and how the return from functions work. So I've got an example today that um, you'll notice if anyone's looked at the assignment spec already that um, the... Uh, this lecture today has a whole lot of stuff about 2D arrays and things, and also some stuff about functions, and all of it leads into stuff that you need for the assignment. So there's a little bit of um, uh, today's lecture being the the final bits and pieces that become the fundamental pieces for the assignment. So if you ever if you ever need to go back and and go over things while you're doing the assignment, this is probably the lecture that will help a lot of people get started with that. Um, Someone said week, so it's week seven. I think you're talking about the due date there, right, Kavan? Um, the due date is the Sunday just before week seven. I tend to call it week six because it's the end of week six. Okay, so a bit of a recap of what functions are. I kind of said this a second ago. So every function has some code that can be called by name and that will make it run. So when we set up a function, it has an output type which is what it will transform into when it finishes running. It's also, you can think of it as what type of value it returns when it finishes. And that may be a, a variable type, but it also might be a void that says I return nothing. Um, and it will have some input parameters. It's important to think that it will only ever have one output type, but multiple input parameters. So functions as we know it right now, can only give us back one piece of information, but can take in multiple pieces. I say as we know it, I will give you some mechanisms for doing more than that uh, with functions actually later this week. But we're gonna we're gonna take our time learning about that stuff because it gets a little complicated. Um, it always has a body of code that runs, and those are in the curly brackets. So the curly brackets we've seen a fair bit now um, because our main is always in the curly brackets, and we're starting to get to an understanding now that the main in our code, that int main void thing, is actually a function. The only difference between that and other functions is that when our program runs, it runs the main. So when you type in dot slash, whatever your program name is in the terminal, um, it'll always be the main function that runs first. It might jump into other functions and do things, but C requires us to have a main function somewhere in a program, and that is the thing that actually uh, starts working. Um, then functions will optionally have a return. Um, void functions will just stop when they reach the, the, closing, um, uh, the closing curly brackets, um, but other functions will have to give back some information. So they will have a return um, and then some kind of output that is going to match the type of the function is. Uh, Raymond saying, so a void function returns nothing, it just outputs what it has has to, and that's it. A void function doesn't necessarily output anything. 
Um, so there's two kinds of output that we're thinking of here. One is the output that goes to the user. This is the thing we've been thinking about with printf and scanf. Input and output from human to computer. And then there's the function input and output, which is the function communicating with the rest of the program. So the function communicating with the rest of the program has its inputs and outputs. A void function doesn't commun communicate anything back to the computer. Most of the void functions we've been using have been printing out text to the human, but maybe some void functions might not even do that. They might just perform some kind of task and not give anything back to the, um, the program itself. At the moment, if we think about it like that, we're thinking like, why would that even exist? Because that kind of doesn't do anything. But we'll get to that later because we have ways of making that uh, do interesting things after Friday. <laughs> Okay, uh, Raman saying, will our knowledge after this lecture be enough to complete the entire assignment? Yes. Let me be 100% certain in the back of my head. Mostly. There's one thing that I think it's not bad to have done the tutorials and labs this week. Because this week, basically this week is a little bit dedicated to solidifying what we know about functions. Um, but also... Um, working with arrays and functions, but also there's a few things in the lab that are specifically tailored to stuff that's in the assignment. And there's stuff today in the lecture that's also specifically tailored. Yeah. Yes, Miguel, the control D thing, we are gonna go through that and we'll... we'll um, so I'm doing a little bit of that today in the lecture and that's also in the labs as well. So you'll get a bit of help from your tutors with that one. Um, I'm getting to it, I'm getting to it. Let me, let me actually just continue going with the functions and we'll see. Okay, so here is the function that I showed you last week. It's an add function. So there's a couple of components that we have um, for the functions where here, before we use any code, we declare what our functions are. Um, declaring what our functions are allows us to say, these are the things that we can jump out from our code into. So we can jump out to these other functions if we use them by name and we give them the correct information. And we can use them in here. When we compile, this thing, if it's going to use it, needs to know just at least the input-output format of these. And then once it's finished compiling, when it runs, it'll know it can jump down here and run this code. So down here is where we actually put all the code. We'll usually put... Um, a comment here saying what the function will do as well. Here I've just used comments just saying how the function's laid out. So I have said a bit, a, bit, a bit about this before, but it's nice to know at least why we're using functions. So a lot of the time we might be using the same code multiple times. And instead of writing the code multiple times, or we're using the same code with multiple different variables, and when you're using it with multiple different variables, you can't write the same thing again and again, or you can't even put it in a loop um, because the variables that it's ask, accessing, if they change, they're going to be, uh, it's going to kind of going to be different code. But functions are going to allow us to replicate code and give different information to the code every time it runs. So um, functions mean that instead of having the same code multiple times, what we would have is the same function call multiple times, but the bulk of the code that's in the function call will be somewhere else and only written once. Um, makes it much easier to modify our code if we, um, uh, if we need to make a change to how something works. We don't have to find all the different places we've used that same section of code. We only have it once in our function. So it makes it much easier for us long-term uh, developing things if we've separated things into functions initially. The other thing it does is it makes a couple of things really easy to organize. So functions allow us to kind of separate our code file into chapters. So it's like this chapter does the printing out of my data. This chapter does the looping through of the data and finding out uh, what the maximum is or something like that. This other bit of code does the looping through of the data and um, uh, say adding one to everything in it or something, you know, so there's lots of different things. And what you can do then is say that anytime you want to perform a particular task, you know which function it is, it narrows down the amount of code you need to look at to, to work on any particular thing. Um...
So a couple of looks like Raymond's asking if you declare and define together at the top line, it's still possible. Uh, Raymond, it's possible only in a certain set of circumstances. So if you go back and look at the Q and A from the last lecture, so lecture six, the Q and A at the end, someone did ask that question. I went through and and I showed how there are actually situations where having um, having all of your code in functions before your main won't actually work. And we'll actually see a bit of that today, I think. If I remember correctly, it's either today or next week. Actually, no, it might be Friday, where I put together some functions that use other functions. And then once you have functions that use other functions, you can't have all the code above in the main because they, they will need to see the other function and then that it exists before they can run. It's a little bit complicated, but you, you'll you'll see when we get there, I think. Um, uh, MX is asking, how does the function know the ints, like which one's which? So when the function's called, it'll get two inputs here. First input will match up with this first one. Second input will match up with the second one. So it will take the value from this variable. So four goes in here six goes in here, which means A will equal four and B will equal six. So the ordering is important. The way that it's ordered, we'll hold it together. Oh, Miguel's already answered that. Thank you, Miguel. Uh, Raman, I'm not exactly sure what your question is there. How else do we go about declaring and defining it? Um, I think people were asking about other questions about, say, putting all of this code up here before the main. So not only does it make your whole thing harder to read because the main gets pushed further down so the main entry point disappears, um, it can have problems if you have multiple functions that use each other. Um, then you need really strict ordering up here and things get messy. Oh, right, I already answered it. Cool. Okay. So I want to add a concept that we have actually been using the whole time from our very first program. But now I want to explain exactly what it is. C has this thing called libraries. Um, libraries are basically stuff that was, was written by people, the people who maintain what C is as a programming language. Um, some of these were written by the people that invented C in the first place. Um, and libraries are made up of a whole bunch of functions that we can use and um, they're called the C standard libraries um, because they're considered to be the things that C will provide for you so the bits of code that you don't have to write for yourself um, the bits of code that um, you can just use based on the fact that they sort of exist as it is so standard input output is something we've used heaps um, so we've been using primarily printf and scanf from these. And so we've just been assuming they exist, assuming they work, that someone else has written the code and um, they will send information to the terminal or they will read text from the terminal one way or the other. Um, if anyone has seen there's a C reference in the weekly tests, it has a whole bunch of different libraries and information about um, uh, about what uh, what all the functions in those libraries do. You can also look these up. So if you just Google C standard libraries, there's a whole lot of reference material about those. Um, so I'm gonna mention a few other libraries. Some of these we're gonna get reasonably well acquainted with. Some of them are just there to be useful. So we can think of the C standard library as us programming in like some kind of workshop. And there's all these tools on the wall. There's all these different spanners on the wall and hammers on another wall. and saws and files and like you know i don't know if we're doing woodworking we we'd, we'd learn about lots of the different tools in the same way when we're crafting things out of code some of these tools we're going to get to know really well so for example the printf and scanf is a tool that you would use all the time like i don't know hammer and nails or something like that um but there are heaps of other ones there where you look at it and you say what even is that tool what does it do and, and some would say, well, that's a really, really advanced tool for a really specific purpose. So that's a cutting tool for when you're using a lathe to turn the wood or something, right? So it's the really, really specific things. Um, your C standard library has the same kind of thing. Some of these you may never use, um, but someone else might use them a lot. 
right? So um, it's not necessary to learn how all of them work, but I'm going to show you a few and some of the useful things you can have. So math.h is one that's reasonably useful, has a lot of common maths functions. Math.h tends to have, I think if I remember correctly, everything in math.h is doubles, so floating point numbers. Um, the C standard library, there's actually one called standard library, standard lib, stdlib, st standard lib.h. That has a lot of useful functions. We're actually going to start um, nearly including standard lib.h in every program the same way that we include, include standard input output in every program. Once we get to a certain point, it's nearly, it's nearly necessary to always have it. Um, I'll show you things that we use from that uh, at least one or two this week, but more ne uh, on Friday once we get into um, direct mem memory management, which we're going to do on Friday. So there's different ways to find information about these. Uh, Googling the actual library name or um, the functions from the library is handy. Um, it's one of those things, though, where if you don't know what the functions are, you might not know that stuff is done automatically for you in these. So it's a matter of just kind of exploring and practicing before you can get a full hang on these. Um, yeah, and as I'm saying here, don't worry if you don't understand a lot of them. I mean, there's plenty of them I don't understand, but hopefully if you do ever come across them and you see that they're documented in a very formal way, it's often okay to kind of look at them and go, oh, this is what I want to do with that particular function. So I wouldn't worry about going through them and trying to learn them all. Um, it's more a matter of like practicing things, playing around with things and seeing which things can help you. Um, and a lot of it's going to be, I will introduce libraries as we go and show you some different functions from libraries that are gonna help for different things. Okay, got some examples. Uh, morning Tom, how's it going? Um, Kai is asking, can you have more than one library in one section of code? Uh, I hope that this slide here answers your question. Um, so, um, so all of these three files will be accessible in this piece of code here. And also just going back to that little question there, MX was asking and people are, were answering that the ints A and B are declared when you write the function. Yeah. So the ints A and B are basically created when you write the function and they're created using the values that are passed into the function from other variables. Um, yes, so Kai was just asking if we can have more than one library active, I guess, at a time. Yes, we can here. So we've got a math.h and a standard lib.h and a standard input output.h. All of these are now active in this code, which means we can use things from them. So here I've done this thing. This function is abs which is absolute value of first number. So what that's going to do is make this an absolute value. So that's just, absolute value is kind of like, what is it? The distance from zero that the number is. So this would change first number to four. Um, absolute value, it's weird, is not actually from the math library. I'm pretty sure it's from the standard library um, because I think it works on integers and doubles. Whereas everything in the math library is all doubles. If I remember correctly, I'm pretty sure absolute value is from standard library. But square root here is from the math library. And so if I want to calculate the square root of a number, um, I can use square root from the math library. And if you want to, you can go into detail and have a look in, um, in some of these libraries and see what functions they offer. Uh, I will, I, I give you a caveat on that. It's a bit of a minefield. There's lots of stuff in there. Um, and there's this one here called printf, which we probably ignored because we were like, oh no, that's just printing stuff to the terminal. You will see how as time goes on, some of these tools become instinctive. Some of them just become the stuff that you use all the time. And other stuff when it's new, you go, oh, that's interesting. I could use that for some things that I want to do. So some of these things are, are things that you will definitely be using, um, like printf, and you'll just get a hang of it. And then when you come, when it comes down to it, you'll start to realize that this is running a function that is declared here in standard input output.h. These includes are really similar to those function declarations we were putting above our main. This is like putting, I don't know how many are in each of these, like 50 different function declarations for each of these at the top of our code. So our code knows that all these functions exist. And when it's called in here, we know this links up 
was something we saw in this library, which means the code's available elsewhere. Um, when we're working in, um, uh, in C, all we need to do is do this hash include and we have access to that code. Someone else has written it, it does exist somewhere, it looks reasonably similar to what we're writing. Not exactly similar, if you look at some of this stuff, sometimes it's really complicated, it's not really made for human consumption. But um, if, you, if you get good enough at C, you can read that stuff and go, okay, I understand what those things are doing. Um, they're a bit fiddly though. Um, I'd say if you look at it and you don't understand it, don't worry, just use it. So this is like the idea, standing on the shoulders of giants, right? Someone else wrote this code, I'm going to use it, and it's going to get me closer to my goal without me having to understand or implement myself all of these little things. Um, yes, Alan's asking, so without standard input output .h, uh, printf won't work. That's correct. So without the declaration of the function before the main, this function won't exist to us. So these hash includes are nearly like copy pasting a whole bunch of function declarations up here so that we can use them. Um, Jake's asking, would having lots of libraries make code compile run slower? Um, it won't make it run any differently because I think that only the bits of the libraries that you're using end up in your program, but I'm not 100% sure on that. I know that um, it will make it compile a little bit slower, but whether you can tell that or not is another story, because it might be in milliseconds. At the level that we're working now, we're not worried about speed, so we're worried about getting things working. I think that the cost benefit of it, if you really wanted to look at it, it's still better to use stuff from libraries, because you don't have to write it yourself. So it's going to take less time. Having said that, when there's an error in your code and it goes into a library and the error comes out of the library, then it's harder to know what's going on. Um, but usually, if someone else has written the code and it's been at least verified in some way, I prefer just using theirs. Okay. So, now we've got the ability to add in libraries and we have lots of different libraries. Um, we're going to be using a few of these on Friday when we do memory management. The standard lib is going to be the one that we use for memory management. And in other topics that, that, that we have coming up um, pretty soon, actually, we're actually going to be bringing in more libraries. So at the moment, what we've taught so far in the course is how to program without adding on all this extra stuff. But as we go into it, we're going to start looking at accessing other people's code and things like that. and on top of that, um, one of the cool things we can do is start building our own libraries. So for the moment, we were talking about just the C standard library. So we're talking about just grabbing stuff from people who wrote C itself. When we get deeper into it, we can actually pull in stuff from our own libraries. So for example, um, I've been sort of working on something that could be considered a library over the course of the lectures. I've been working on this dice library, the ability to roll dice, the ability to know statistics about dice, the ability to verify dice input and all this kind of stuff. If I wanted to, I could make a dice library where all of that stuff is available. And then I could include my own dice library in my programs when I'm making games for other things. So, um, that's one of the ways that, um, that that libraries work. But we will be using these more as we go along, so you don't have to know everything about them now. Having said that, the fact that we've been using standard input output library, scanf and printf, means you actually at least instinctively know a lot about how libraries work. Okay, uh, move my face out of the way of the text there. Another thing that I wanted to talk about today is using the output of functions. So we've seen functions a little bit, um, but I haven't talked about the specific ramifications about what happens when a function finishes running and it transforms into its output and how to use it. Um, so we have seen some things like expressions that can be evaluated. So for example, if I put a plus B in my code somewhere. Once we look at that A plus B, my program when it runs is going to take that A plus B and say, this is not going to be three separate symbols. When I, when I finish sort of evaluating this, it's going to be a single number. 
Functions are going to be like that as well. You call a function and the function has an output type. Um, when that function finishes running, it's going to basically transform itself into a single value. Um, or a void, it's just going to disappear entirely. Um, but other things are going to, anything with an output type is going to transform itself into a single value. And then that value can be used by other bits of your code. Um, and I have an example using scanf. So I have a, a bit of example code um, from the lecture slides today, uh, well, alongside the lecture slides in WebCMS. I'll show you in a second. And it shows how scanf actually returns something. So up until now, we've been using scanf like it was a void function. We've never been taking scanf and saying, what is the output of the scanf and what does it do? Um, but scanf actually does output something. So scanf, after it finishes running, it will tell you how many values it read in correctly. So when we run scanf, we say, please read in a value of this type from text. Well, it's not even a value, it's kind of like, please re read in a string of characters from the terminal, convert it into a particular format, and then store it somewhere in memory. For each thing that it does successively of that type, um, it will tell us that it has done that at least once. So basically it will return an integer saying this is how many pieces I read into memory. That number that we read back from scanf allows us to know whether the input was valid or not. So this is, remember these questions that we got very early on with scanf. People are saying, can we, can we use scanf in a way to tell whether it's done stuff correctly or not? Can we use scanf to check for valid input? The answer was actually yes. But at the time, the answer was no, because I was going to have to teach you about variable types and functions before I was going to be able to give you that answer properly. So now we're at the point where I do have that answer for you. This is how scanf works. So let me hop onto VLAB. put myself back up there going to my comp 1511 directory and I set up a lecture 7 directory with a couple of things that's something that we're going to do later today um, but I'm going to show you my scanf demo so here's a little thing I prepared earlier let me just do that move that a little further out of your way this is showing a couple of the different ways that we can use scanf. So here is some basic scanf saying, I've got an array of numbers. I happen to have initialized them all as zeros. I don't necessarily have to initialize them, but here's a simple thing that we could think of that reads in 10 numbers, one at a time, scans in those numbers, and puts them into a certain point. Actually, we should probably put that integer. You know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna put this here. Sometimes I prefer my counter integers to be right there before the loop um, because it, it means it's easier for me to see exactly where they should be. Um, right, so this code should be reasonably obvious in that we're looping, except there's no num count plus plus. It's a little bit weird, right? But there's no num count plus plus. Instead, we've got this plus equals. So plus equals is something that was actually in the slides last week, but I didn't um, didn't talk about it in the slides. Plus equals says I'm going to take this variable and increase it by I'm going to add it to um, the the variable or the value that comes up here. So scanf, if we take in the idea that scanf returns the number of inputs that were read correctly, what this means is that if this was valid, if scanf gets the valid value here, it will return one. So num count will plus equal one, um, which means that um, num count will go up by one if scanf read in a valid number and stored it. So this while loop will run 10 times if it gets 10 valid inputs. It's a little bit weird if it doesn't get 10 valid inputs though. 
Um, and that goes into like the deeper things about scanf. But this while loop, if it gets 10 valid values, will actually run correctly and it will enter these 10 numbers in. So the counter will go up every time scanf uh, reads correctly. Um, there's other ways to scan in 10 numbers. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so Nikhil, you were just asking there about the plus equals, right? So let me. Um, Actually, I'm going to go back here. Where are we? My slides. This is this one. Lecture six. Because I do have, I do actually have a slide for this, but I didn't, um... There we go. So, plus equals will do the same thing as something equals something plus something. So this is me saying um, I will add this value to this variable. So both a and b are now equal to 5 in this example. So we call this one an accumulator because what we do is we keep doing plus equals to a variable, it will just keep accumulating the values that I add to it. So if I loop this multiple times, this is like me doing a loop that jumps five every time instead of one every time. Um, right. Okay, so a couple of questions there. Osama is saying that's why scanf doesn't work with strings, isn't it? Um, scanf can sort of work with strings. When we get to strings, so strings for everyone, this is like jumping ahead a little bit, is kind of words, series of letters together. We're going to give you a lot of techniques for working with those later. In fact, that's where we start using libraries a lot because there's lots of string libraries that allow us to work with multiple characters at a time. Um, numbers are easier to start off with because they're kind of individual concepts, like every number is just an individual thing and so we can use an integer for it instead. Anyway, so that's some new syntax that we we're looking at there for the plus equals. Here's another way of doing this, so that's a while loop way of doing this. If we wanted to be really, really silly about it, we could do all of this in a single scanf. Multiple numbers going into multiple places. This works, but I mean like I don't really like writing code like this, frankly. Um, the other thing that's interesting at scanf will say, I'm going to grab 10 numbers. And I haven't put any spaces in between these, but scanf knows the difference. It'll say anything that's white space in between these, like spaces and enter keys or anything like that, it will ignore and it'll just look for numbers. However, if you put a single letter in between these, you've got a problem. Stuff's going to go weird um, in here and it's potentially not going to be able to even complete running. Um, or it'll just read in the numbers up until it read a letter, and then all the rest of them will be blank. So, I can't remember exactly what it's going to do, but I'm pretty sure that's the one it's going to do. The rest of these are just not going to get filled out. There's another thing here, and this is the kind of question that um, we were looking at in... Um, when we were looking at early scanf, is can we just keep looping until we get the, the kind of result we want to? Um, or I think this one is, oh, right, right. This is, this is the one that, um, that will probably help with both the labs and, and Tom's saying, yeah, it would be much better style, uh, if I separated these symbols because it looks really bad to have these all clumped together like this. It's going to be better for you to think about what you're doing if there's spaces in between these things. Okay. Anyway, here... We have the idea that, okay, scanf, scanf is going to tell us how many things it read in. So what we could do is we can say, keep scanning in if we're getting the correct input. The point at which we are not getting the correct input anymore will stop looping and it's over. Um, and so this is this control D thing that some people were talking about earlier. We're going to go through this in your tutorials as well. So when I type in control D in my input here, when I'm putting input into a program, what it will actually be doing is it will 
um, be saying to my scan F or whatever that's in here, there is no more input. So that's me saying, typing into the terminal, control D says I will no longer be typing anything into the terminal. That's the end of everything that I was typing into the terminal. What happens when scan F reads in that control D? It's actually kind of, it's like a symbol that goes in. It's gonna say that was not a valid number. If that was not a valid number, so here we're gonna loop and up to 10 times, but it could be less than 10. We're gonna keep looping here and we have a keep looping flag, they often call these here. And this is that, that, that format that we were using for sentinel variables, where it's like, if it's one, we keep looping. If it changes to zero, we're going to stop looping. And so we're going to keep scanning in, but every time we scan in, we're going to say, what's the result of the scanning in? So the result of the scanning in says, did we get a valid value or did we get something else? If we got a valid value, then result will be equal to one. So every time we loop, we scan in something. And if it was a number, this becomes one. And then we say, if it wasn't one, then we didn't receive a valid input. So that was the last loop. So we, we, we won't be able to continue from there. So keep looping will be equal to zero. We'll come back up here. And if keep looping was zero, then our while loop will, 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 will leave. We'll stop running the while loop. So this is one thing that we can do with scanf that says, keep going and always keep taking the input until the input we get is something that we didn't want. And so that way, what we can do is we can say, um, you keep typing in numbers. But if you stop typing in a number and you type in a letter or something, or you press control D to say there are no more numbers remaining, um, this, uh, this loop will then stop trying to read numbers after that point. So this is the kind of thing where we can say, we don't know exactly how many numbers are going to come in, but we know that we will read, read exactly as many numbers that come in and then we'll stop. Um, the other thing I think, yeah, the way that this will work is that when we're done with this, the variable number count here will tell us how many things were read in. So it will be, get one added to it every time the result is correct. And when the result is incorrect, it will, I'm pretty sure have nothing added to it. So the num count at the end should tell us, um, unless there's some specific codes that are not equal to one. We'll see. We'll see about that. So this thing then allows us to loop multiple times and say, uh, um, um, take only the set of numbers in that we needed. If we want to, we can actually um, take this whole while loop. So doing this, I sort of exploded it out so you can see everything that's happening. This can actually be done much more, more efficiently in our code with just this smaller while loop here. So this actually does the same functionality as, as, as that loop there, where we start from zero and we could do this. In fact, I'm gonna, I'm gonna even take this out cause that's not even, oh wait, wait, wait. It is, it is I think necessary. Yeah. Cause the zero, you're not always gonna get a zero if it fails. Um, so scanf might give you other error codes that are not um, one or zero. So I think that the equals one is in there intentionally. I'm just picking up past Mark's brain because I wrote this. And so I know that I did put the equals one in here for a reason. So note what I'm doing here. The while loop usually has an expression in the question there, which says that um, something in that... Um, in those brackets has to equate to like a one or a zero for us to decide whether we're not we're going to continue our loop this doesn't have to just be do we know something about the world this can be let's run a whole function in the question of the while loop and then check what its output was here and then we only go into the loop if it was that so what we're going to do here now is we'll try to scan a number in so we'll always try to scan a number in uh, if we get a number we add one to the number of to the count of numbers that we have, and then we'll go again. But if at any point it doesn't equal one and we don't get another number in, then we say, okay, we're done. And then we exit the while loop. So this little bit of code here is able to 
keep reading in integers from the terminal until we don't receive an integer for the terminal. And so one of the things that we can do to, to really clearly say when we're typing stuff in um, that when we're intending this to not be an integer and we want this loop to finish is we can press control D here and then when we press control D this will scan in looking for a number it will see that control D and it won't say it read a number incorrectly so it won't be one and then this while loop won't run and it will exit out so it kind of works like that um, yeah, so Raymond, I think Raymond was just asking, how does the scanf in the while loop condition work? And that's that's kind of how it works. So what it does is, everything in the while loop condition will run. So it will scanf every time, but this equals one will only be true if the scanf actually read in a number. So play around with this if you want. It's a little hard to... Um, see what's going on in the whole example if you try to run all of it at a time because it'll be multiple scan apps. but what you can do is you can come in here and you can um you can comment out sections of this oh actually i think i realized why num count was at the beginning because it's getting used in multiple places i'm gonna put that back um, you can comment out different sections of this and you can see how the different things work. Some of them are going to have problems with the input ending at different times. Other things are going to keep running um, and they'll work. Um, some of these things will be able to store partial um, parts of the array. Other things will try to only store the whole array and they won't work if anything goes a bit weird. So you'll see how all these different things um, can work. All right, I'm going to swap back into my code. I don't, I don't really have enough time to go through all of this as a full example, but I hope that gives you a bit of information um, as to as to how this works. So, if anyone's having trouble with how this one works, I think it's better to look at this because this does the same thing as this, but it's got more words, so it's easier for us to understand what's going on. And it's okay to write code like this until you have a full understanding of the subtleties and the shortcuts I took to get to this point. And then you can sort of get to that eventually. All right, I'm gonna pop back out of that because I'm not, I'm not gonna to go too deep into that now. The stuff that's in this scanner stuff is also going to be in your Tutin lab this week. So you can talk to your tutor about that. Okay, oh, that's the other lecture. All right, so that's the scanf example. So I wanted to also do a recap of arrays because we're going to be using arrays today. And we're using a slight expansion on arrays uh, from what we did last week. So last week it was like collection of variables um, that that's uh, laid out in memory and you can access them by accessing the index of those variables. So here we have an example of that working. So I've got a, um, a double array this time. We actually haven't been using doubles that much. We've been using ints for a lot of what we've been doing, but plenty of what we're doing works just the same um, with doubles as it did with integers. So anytime that we could use an integer as a variable, um, there, are, there are a lot of ways we can use doubles as variables in a similar way. So I'm going to make an array of doubles in the same way that I could have made an array of integers. So an array of four doubles, all starting at zero. If I want to assign a value, so remember the square brackets, the square brackets are the symbol for the array. So they're going to say, if I have a type at the beginning, I'm creating a new one. So anytime you see a type name at the start of something, it means you're declaring something. So I'm declaring a function called, called main, and it's an integer type function. I'm declaring an array called my array and it's a double type array here I've got the square brackets which means there's something to do with an array but I don't have a type at the beginning me not having a type at the beginning means I'm not making a new one I'm using one that already exists so the confusion we sometimes get is the square brackets here means I'm creating something of size 4 the square brackets here say I'm accessing something at index 1 so this is the second element of the array. I'm accessing the second element of the array because I'm jumping over the first element. 
Um, so one is how far I'm jumping over the first element. So jump just one over the first element, that's the second element, and we're replacing its value with 0.95, with the equals that assigns a value to a variable. Once we've used an individual element of an array like this, it will appear just as if it's a single variable like this. So my array, square brackets one, says second element of the array, and I'm just changing its value. If I want to test a value, I can do the same thing. If I want to print out a value, I'll do the same kind of thing. Remember, the percent %LF is how we present, present long floating point numbers, which are doubles. All of this stuff should be, I guess, starting to sink in. Um, your tutorials and labs this week will continue looking at arrays, so you'll get a bit more of this. Um, what's happening in there that Tom is talking to people? I'm gonna let uh, I'm gonna let Tom talk uh, talk to people about what's going on. All right, okay. So continuing the recap, if we wanted to access multiple variables at a time, one of the while loops that I taught you is exactly perfect for this, in that it will loop through all of the elements of the array, starting from index zero, ending just before the length of the array, because remember. The length might be something, but the indexes go up to one less than the length. So this is a simple thing that loops through and prints out all the values of an array. Um, this one's doing one per line, because it's doing a new line after each number. Um, so the most basic while loop that I taught you that goes an exact number of times is perfect to go through an array, goes through the exact number of times. This four here is something that we may do a hash to find. So a hash to find would allow us to like always know exactly the size of that array. And then we can have something like array size here in all caps, and that might make things easier. Um, a lot of the time when we run functions on arrays, um, we will pass in the array and we will pass in the size of the array as a separate variable. And we'll be able to use the size of the array as a separate variable to know how long we're gonna loop through it or to know where the end of the array is so that we don't go over it, that kind of thing. Um, so very often when we're using functions and arrays, we won't just pass the array in. We'll pass in the array and um, and the size. But sometimes there's two ways of doing it. The other way is we can hash define the size of the array so that we can see that all through the, the program in a sense. Um, one thing that I hinted at but we didn't necessarily go um, go too deep into is that arrays will be created in a sense before nearly before the program runs so before the program runs it doesn't have any variables and it doesn't know what possible values any of its variables are so you can't actually do something like this I can't have an integer variable that's array size and then declare the array of that size because when the array is actually created is before this variable can be created. So it's a, it's a bit weird, but it means that when we're laying out everything in memory before we start running our program, the space for these arrays is actually already kind of reserved in advance. So we can't say make an array of this size while we're running. We can say that this, the size four here, because it's it's a number that can't change, that's fine. A hash to find we can use, but we can't create an array um, based on a variable size like this. So it's one of the limitations of arrays, and it comes from the fact that they're laid out in memory in advance. Um, it is slightly annoying that you can't do this because this is something that could be considered quite useful, but at the same time the, the trade-off is that the way that these things are laid out is actually really nice when you're looking at it from a memory organization perspective. Um, but yeah, that's something that we don't really care about at this point in time, so this will be something that just sort of hinders you, but stick with it because later on you'll realize why this is handy. Um, 
Alan's asking, what if you define array size? If we hash define array size, then we're fine. Yes. Um, someone else is asking, oh, the curly brackets with the zero, that will set all the values in the array to zero to begin with. This being a double array, that probably could should be 0, 0.0, but this we will get away with it because you can fudge the numbers like that. It will be able to see this as 0, 0.0. Okay, so just be careful with that in that we can't declare an array using a variable as its size. Instead, as um, who was saying that there? Uh, Alan was saying if we if we do a define for array size, yes. And um, I always love that, right? I was saying that last week. I love it when people ask questions and it's on the next slide. It means you're in the same mind flow that I am when I'm, when I'm teaching, which is great. So if we do potentially want to change the size of the array during development, we can't change it while it's running. But during development, if we're not sure exactly and we may change it, we can define something like this and we can use it. Um, so this isn't, isn't usually going to be called array size. It's usually going to be a name that makes sense, like um, number of players that we did in the, in the last example and things like that. We could, we could do that with a constant. Okay. Oh, I'll put my face on. Oh, no, I can't. I don't fit. <laughs> my head's too big. I um, always like to have a little meme about these. So... An array is a type of variable, yes. Uh, an array is something that gives us access to multiple elements inside of itself. It doesn't mean it's not a variable. It's, it is actually a variable. And an array can contain any type of variable, which means that we can put arrays inside arrays. So if I have a type of variable which is like an array that has five elements in it and then I make an array that contains arrays that have five elements in them then I have what we call multi-dimensional arrays so that means if I have a set of arrays that all have a set of elements in them then Oh, Eric, that is an amazing pun. Eric just said in, in chat, you deserve a raise, as in a pay raise, for all these arrays. <laughs> Are you a mature age student, Eric? Because that was a dad joke. <laughs> anyway, if we do this in two dimensions, we have arrays of arrays, then we can get a square grid of values which is very different from our one long line of possible arrays with a square grid we can um we can then have kind of coordinates and we can represent a space that then is a um is a is a variable itself that array of arrays is a variable so if i have an array of those i'm going to rotate this thing an array of those going along i have three dimensional space and I can have a three coordinate based three dimensional space of arrays. And those cube arrays, if I make an array of those cube arrays, then I've got these cube arrays stacked next to each other. Then I've got four dimensional space. And then if I have that four dimensional space of arrays, so an array of cube arrays, and I consider that to be a variable, then I can have a five dimensional array and then pfft. right. Okay. So at some point, usually the human brain gives up on trying to understand these things. Uh, we're going to go to 2d and we're going to stop at two dimensions because I think that as humans, we can understand two dimensions because it's like walking around on, on in a flat area. Um, we're not going to look at three dimensional or any higher dimensional arrays. Um, in the course there may be if you really really want to there may be an opportunity to look at three-dimensional arrays at the harder end of the assignment but I'm not even sure if that's the case maybe if you want to go into the uber challenge level the the Hall of Fame challenge level of the assignment which is just you do whatever you want to do Tom said that's not true I'm not sure what I just said that's not true Tom so you may have to elaborate on that one um, Anyway, so 
let's just look at the two dimensional arrays and we'll see um, we'll, we'll see what we can we can learn about that okay I'm gonna put my face back up in the other corner so two-dimensional arrays we can think of as a grid oh Tom saying you might need 3d arrays but only for like the super hard bits yeah ah uh, <laughs> yeah I'm only gonna get your chat I think maybe three seconds after I talk and also I'm only gonna look at it occasionally so okay so let's go on to two-dimensional arrays so there are grid so there's an array here that has three elements in it and each element of this array is these five elements so there's my index 0 contains another array with of integers my index 1 contains another array of integers and this way we get a two-dimensional array um, what we then get is the ability to use coordinate pairs to access individual elements so C is going to actually make this easier for me. It has a syntax for this. So instead of me saying, okay, go into an array and then go into that element and then find an element, we actually have a way of just addressing this like it's a, a, a 2D space. So this is how we do it. In fact, actually, when we think about it, the syntax is the same as the 1D arrays because we're just adding this bit onto the end. When we create a 2D array, we can create this kind of grid and we can say, this is um, how many arrays there are and this is how many elements are in each array for the moment as we do two-dimensional arrays we're going to use one particular convention is that the first number is going down the column and the second number is going across into each of the each of the elements inside we do that because that's the way that we're going to be printing these things out if we did it the other way, the first coordinate was going left to right, and then the other one was going up and down, it makes it a little bit harder for us to loop through these things. So that's why if you've looked at the assignment and you've gone, why is the coordinate system row first, then column? It's like the opposite of the way that maths would do it. It's actually really old school reasons why you do this. You know, your computer screen. Like, the way these used to work, uh, if anyone's seen CRT monitors, monitors with the big back end and the giant glass, um tube bit all the way through it um they used to have like a beam that comes from the back of the monitor and it points at like the pixel and then these magnets around the beam that would actually move the beam across so it would read from the top left corner across to the right then it would go down a row and then down a row and then as the beam went across your screen it would light up certain parts of it in different ways and so that's old school and the really weird thing about this is our LCD monitors do that they actually write your pixels in that order um, from that <laughs> from the way that the old like CRT monitors used to do it so we haven't changed the techniques we use for these things even though the technology doesn't need it anymore like we could build LCD panels that just flicked all of their pixels one uh, like at, together at once but instead we still just go through like this I think it's just because our computers prefer doing things one at a time rather than necessarily doing 1920 by 1080 pixels all at the same time. So just the way it is. Um, so that's why we're, we're going to use this as the rows and this as the columns. So when we declare the 2D array, we, um, we say how tall it is and then how wide it is in these square brackets here. Same thing as the arrays we've been using previously. If we have a variable type at the beginning, that means we're creating. If we don't have a variable type, it means we're using something we've created earlier. So it's got the same name here. And then for us to get an individual integer here, we have to give both of the, um, uh, both of the kind of coordinate pairs for where this thing is. And then we can say, okay, set a value to that or read a value from that, print out a value, that kind of thing. Again, same thing as other arrays once you've used the square brackets to access an individual element of the array um, you can treat it like it's the type that's stored in the array the bonus that you can do with this which is a little weirder is if i was to put only a single square brackets on this then i would be looking at a row so i could use the um the single square brackets to say okay i'm going to look at an array 
that's inside this array of arrays. Or I use the two square brackets to say, okay, I'm looking at an individual element. Um, Nikhil's saying, yeah, this is like grid, row, column, totally. Yeah, that's exactly the way that we can think of it. So, this then now gives us the ability not just to have collections of integers, but to organize those collections of integers into spaces that we can use for things. All right, let's take a break. It's a little bit later than I would normally break, but I just thought, I'm just gonna move myself down here. <laughs> I love this GIF, and I think everyone loves this GIF. Everyone always loves this GIF. So we're now building up into harder things, um, which means we're going to see a lot more problems that are harder to deal with. Um, so, so that's why I use this GIF called Problems, and it always gets this response. I love it. It's so it's such a triggering GIF. Um, what I want to say is that it's okay to laugh at your problems because we all have these problems. This thing triggers all of us. Code triggers all of us. Um, we, if we can keep a clear head around our problems and try to break them down into smaller problems, it's easier for us to get through things eventually. So I'm going to take a five minutes break here. And so we'll come back at 12.15 and then I'm going to do an example that uses two dimensional arrays and functions and we'll see how far I can get into it. Because there's a lot that I that I want to show on this, but I want to at least show how we can we can use TD arrays and functions together. All right, let me leave this up for the break.
Ah, oh, I muted it. Oh my god, I was like, it's it's M to the Chi, M to the Chi, teaching you C, teaching you C, M to the C. Anyway, that's I'm, that's as much as I'm going to do. I was so proud of that for a second there. Um, Kat was talking about this. I jumped back in early from the break because Kat was talking about a, a a very popular audio thing on TikTok that, um, that, that sounds a bit like that. And so I thought I'd just jump in there. Okay. So I'm back now. <laughs> You're still proud. That's good. I'm back now and, and the... Uh, Lecture in charge is here. Oh, see, my brand new expensive mic is cutting off your view of chicken. Let me just yeah. say hi to everyone, chicken. I guess I could just pick her up, but that's okay. <laughs> Eric gets it now. Um, at some point, I thought it would be really funny to start a um, a com one five one one TikTok. And I would just like, can I explain a concept in like 15 seconds or something like that? Um, Paco, yes, this is a Rode NT-USB. This is my new microphone. I can't believe that you recognize that just from like a random chunk of the back of it. You must have one. Uh, <laughs> people like Insta follow. Let's, uh, let's continue with our actual work for a bit. And then we will discuss whether I should be get on TikTok as a lecturer later on. I mean, I've like watched a bit of it, but not necessarily like gotten that involved with TikTok. All right. So example I want to do today is this thing called the tourist. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to take in this idea of a two dimensional, uh, grid, and, um, <laughs> Kira Chan was like, please change the slide. I hope you're happy now. We've moved on to, to actual work again, rather than just triggering everyone <laughs> with the, the, the problems gif. Um, <laughs> Tom's like, no, go back. Okay, let's continue. So world is a square grid. So we're going to be looking at our space as if it's a two dimensional grid that we can move around on. And so we're going to have this little tourist. Um, and so this is, this is a throwback to when we could still actually go places. I mean, I guess we could travel within whichever locale that we live in, that we're locked down in. Um, if anyone here is in Melbourne at the moment, I apologize. You basically can't leave your house, but the rest of us can at least a little bit. So what we want to do is we want to be able to say that, um, this little tourist, we can represent where it is and the tourist can move around, um, this world and we're able to see where the world is, where the tourist is. Um, and also if the tourist likes seeing new things, we want to track what they've seen previously and what they haven't seen and, um, and where they go. So we're going to be using the world, the 2d array of the world to track what the tourist has and hasn't seen. Um, and then if we get to this point, I doubt we're necessarily going to get to this point, but we can keep going around it. And if we go back over where we've been before, we can say, oh, we've revisited this. We, we lose the game because we wanted to see new things all the time. So that's the, uh, that's the way. Oh my God. <laughs> Tom's outing me as a flat earther now. <laughs> okay. If you want to, <laughs> we can make a data structure for a, um, a spherical world and, and we'll see how complicated our data structures get immediately when we start doing that. Um, let's not do that. For now, this virtual world that we're in happens to be a square grid. <laughs> oh no, this is where I go viral on YouTube for saying the world is flat. Okay, so some starter code here and this starter code is very specific because it is really, really similar to the starter code for the assignment. It's, it's got less stuff than the assignment because um, uh, it's designed to be a little bit simpler, but it's a really similar format. So I just wanted to, to, to go with this so that we could um, get some practice with saying, okay, here's the starter code and what are we gonna do with it? So this demo should be a little bit similar to how we would start working on, um, start working on something like assignment one. So here I have my tourist.c file. Um, paint.c is the file for assignment one. This is a very, very heavily modified version of it. Also, this is a version I wrote in June, 2019. So it's not even from exactly the same assignment that you have, but it's reasonably similar. So it's, it's okay. It's good enough for us to work with. So 
we have our st standard input output and we have some hash defines for the number of rows and the number of columns uh, that are in our 2D grid. We have a helper function here that prints out the map. Um, it's not exactly, it's definitely not the same as the assignment. This one's tailored to, to what we're actually doing. We've got a main that doesn't have anything in it yet, right? So this is fresh, this is ready for us to do things. But this helper function that we have here prints the map. So in order to print a two-dimensional map, we will use a two-dimensional while loop, which is a loop within a loop. And we've gone through these already, right? So we were able to actually print out a grid of stars. And this is us being able to print out that grid. But instead of it being a grid of stars, it has slightly different information. So the inner while loop here says, which column are we printing? So this one's going across the columns. And while column is less than the number of columns, uh, we are usually just printing out the number that's stored in the map. And since there is no map, we don't know what those numbers are yet, but it's going to print out whatever number is in this integer map that's expecting. If it sees something that matches this integers, these integers for the position row, position column of something, which is going to be where our tourist is, it's going to print a T instead of the number. So that way we're going to be able to track where the um, the tourist is in the map and otherwise we're going to track some numbers about the map. Um, oh cat is would it be possible to cat said would it be possible to make a moving image using arrays in arrays and uh, that's yes that is actually stage five of the assignment is to save multiple images and be able to play them back as well so yeah totally um, it is. I mean, like, it's it's at different levels of difficulty and stuff in the assignment. So hopefully you've learned a lot by the time you get up to that point. <laughs> okay. Ooh. MX. Is the second operation meant to be equals or double equals? Ah, uh, you've spotted me. So this was, I think, where are we? June 2019. I put this in here to see whether people had figured out um, what I had, um, what I'd been saying about the differences between these things. And so I'm really happy that you picked that up really quickly. I'll tell you something about that. I put a single equals in an artificial intelligence algorithm that I wrote a few years back. And because it was artificial intelligence, and because the single equals was magically creating a value that was still correct in the code, it was correct, but it was losing some valuable information along the way. Um, I thought my AI was functioning perfectly, was just a little bit dumber than I expected it to be. And so I spent the next month trying to improve my program. This was, wasn't that long ago, by the way. This was like four or five years ago. I don't remember it really clearly because I literally spent a whole month after that, trying to figure out why my thing wasn't thinking as intelligently as I expected it to. Um, and it was just because of that single equals double equals. Um, and as Miguel says, super annoying bug, it'll still compile, at least with the older kind of more generic compilers it will, DCC will try to tell you. DCC will say, hey, I think there might be an issue. Yeah, Miguel, we could say we shouldn't make it compile, but there are times where we want to assign something um, because assignment actually has a result as well. And so we could say, did this assign properly or not? And I think that's a real old school way of programming in C, but sometimes it still exists. Okay, so I'm glad that, um, I'm glad that um, MX picked that up there because um, that, actually as Tom says, warning you is good. Anyway, so that's something that would have made this very interesting but we would have got a compiler warning to remind us. Anyway, so this is going to loop through and it's going to print out each row and then each row gets printed. So what we should get is one row gets printed, then another row, then another, then, a, then another. So having said that, that's enough information for us to get started. Let's think about how we're going to um, work on this problem. So. What do we need to do first? We need to set up the information that we're storing. So we're going to have a grid and we're going to have the tourist position in the grid. 
And then we're going to want to be able to make the tourist move, which means we're going to have something to do directions. Um, we'll move one step at a time. Um, and then we want to track where the tourist has been by flicking the zeros to ones as we move around and that kind of thing. All right, let's start with the, the earlier bits though. We're going to set up the grid in the tourist position. So the grid, as you can expect, because this is the lecture following me introducing two-dimensional arrays, that we're going to use a two-dimensional array. So this is easy for now. So a lot of our problem solving in, in lectures is really easy because it's like, do what Mark just spoke about. But when you get deeper into programming, it's going to be, I have these 18,000 different techniques that I can use to make programs work. Which one of these do I want to use now? Um, and that becomes one of the most difficult skills of programmers. It's like, there's a whole field that we call code design, which is like, we know the problem. We know exactly how to solve the problem. That doesn't make it easy. Even knowing exactly how to solve the problem, we still have to decide how we want our code to solve the problem. And there's so many different ways that it can work that it becomes a difficult uh, proposition to figure out which of these we want to use. For the moment, storing my two-dimensional grid in a two-dimensional array seems fine. So I'm going to call it map, and it's a two-dimensional array. Um, I'm going to set it up as all zeros, but I need to know how many rows and columns this is going to have. Good thing is I've got these hash defines here already. So n rows and n columns. Um, note that this matches up really nicely with this. So I know that um, the function that I'm going to use to print this thing out is going to use exactly the same format. And even to the point where I've got the same name, but remember, remember that it's not necessarily the same. When we pass something into a function, it gets, um, it gets its own version in the function. It's a bit different with arrays, gets a bit fiddly. It is actually going to be able to access this array. I'm going to tell you more about that later. So we've got our array and then we have the tourists position. So we're going to have two integers for this. So tourist row, and I might actually, I was nearly going to put these together, but I don't think I will. No, no. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to set up a starting position. So the tourist row is going to be n rows divided by two. And the tourist column is going to be the number of columns divided by two. We're not going to be exactly in the center of the map, but I mean, a 10 by 10 grid, there is no center. There's four, there's four squares around the center of a 10 by 10 grid, but we're going to be near the center of the 10 by 10 grid when we start. Um, so just to test whether this function is working and this setup, whether I've made the right assumptions, I'm going to print the map now and test that out. So print map wants to take first off an integer, a two dimensional integer array of that size. And so I'm going to give it this map. Then it's wanting to take an integer, which is a row position. So I'm going to give it the tourist row. And then it's going to want the column position. So I'm going to give it the tourist column. And let's see when we run this, if um, this prints out a 10 by 10 grid all zeros except for the position that I'm in, which should be 5-5. Five, five. And then we'll see if this works. Okay, save that. I'm gonna DCC tourist.c and the output. You know what? I'm gonna clear my buffer first so that you can actually see what I'm typing in. DCC tourist.c and the output is tourist. That's compiled. Um, we didn't get a warning because we managed to fix this up before we got there. So I'll run tourist. There's a map of size 10, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And let's check our tourist position, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 
zero, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, so we're at position five, five on the map that's size 10, 10. Um, yeah, so Paco, the only reason I was dividing by two is just so that a tourist starts in a, in a position in the middle. I could have just started them at zero, zero, that's fine as well, because this part of it is up to us. So we don't have to, um, we don't we don't need any particular reason to say why the tourist is in any particular place because this is what we're making up as we go along okay so the good thing is i think that this function is working um i'm never going to say that i know that something's working if i've only run it once <laughs> um and i think that my setup for the coordinates position of the tourist and the um the map of the virtual world virtual flat world <laughs> here is um is all probably working for the moment so we've got square grid world okay so let's try adding some movement so we were we want to be able to have the tourist move between different locations on the map um and one cool thing that we can do here is we can use some of the stuff we've learned about looping to have turns so we can say take in some input, move the tourist to another location, and then loop back and wait for input again. When we get input again, we might move the tourist somewhere else. You may find this useful for the assignment also. Um, strangely enough, what we're doing right here today with the tourist and moving it around and stuff was one candidate idea for the theme for the first assignment. There were other things we could do with the first assignment. I was going to do like a... Um, like um moving some kind of object around or something like that um we've gone for for paint because um i think it's a little easier to see what's going on where you have an idea of like what things ought to look like and then you can visually see how they're working which is why the 2d grid is nice and displaying the 2d grid um not that this wouldn't have been a good first assignment i still think it's a good example um but it's just slightly different Okay, so adding movement, we're going to go and we're going to take input. So this is going to be slightly different from how we would do this in a game itself, but it's actually not that much different from, like, every computer game has a map like this of all of the possible keys that can be typed in and what they do. Um, we're going to use the number pad. So most of you will have a number pad on your keyboard with the numbers 1, 2, 3. Wait, from your view... One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I'm looking at me on the screen. I'm hoping that's the right way. Um, so we're going to use the up, down, left, and right of those numbers to to move ourselves around. Usually, I'd use the letters W A S D, but at the moment we can't do that because we don't do letters yet. But that's okay. Uh, we can do this with numbers, and it'll still work. So what we're going to do is we're going to scan in. A number and we're gonna to have to put that into an integer so I'm gonna have an int called input I might set this as minus one you've seen me do this before when I want to make sure that if anything goes wrong with the input or anything like that um, I know that this value wasn't changed to something that that was valid or anything like that i can use a number like this to be like okay let's just be sure so if i pick up the minus one somewhere i know that something's gone wrong so i'm going to scan f this whatever number that gets typed in and put that into input then i'm going to go through a series of if statements else if etc. I'm going to need a few of these for all the different possible inputs that I care about. So the first one, let's remember comments before coding can sometimes really help us know exactly what we're doing. So I'm going to have a series of else ifs here, I think. And they're not all going to be down. <laughs> Left and then right. I like to do this in this format because then I can fill out what's in these brackets to match what the comment is for what's going to be run if those brackets are true. 
So up, if I look at my number pad here, up is going to be the number eight. So if input equals eight, we're gonna go up. If input equals two, we're gonna go down. So I don't know if everyone's looking at their numpads now and going, okay, I see what I see what's happening here. And if input is equal to four, I go left. And if input is equal to six, I go right. So that gives me this. Actually, I'm not sure if everyone even has numpads because I think a lot of modern laptops no longer have numpads. Everyone there with a MacBook won't have one of these, unless you've got like the really big MacBooks, I think may have it. Uh, people with full PC keyboards are gonna be able to see this. Okay, having said that, you, you've probably seen this kind of number layout before. So even though these numbers aren't going in order, like maybe it would go two, four, six, eight if they're in order, this is some kind of logical order for me. So this is me saying, I'm gonna dictate the logical order um, based on how I I want to code these, and then I'm just gonna set up these variables to fit, or these values to fit that. If I, if I wanted to, I could even do something like hash define two, four, six, eight, as up, down, left, and right in particular ways, and then I wouldn't use these numbers, I just use the, the word for it, and then I wouldn't need as many of the comments. Up to you how you want to do these things. Um, I don't mind, I'm sort of okay with the numbers here, usually I'm, I'm, I don't like any numbers in the code, I like them all to be defined as something, but for now, for this, I think that's probably going to be okay. Okay, so... If we move in a certain direction, we need to change the coordinates that the tourist is in. So the tourist, if it goes up one, should end up in this row. So its row should change, but its column won't change if it just moves up. Um, so this is row zero, one, two, three, four, five. So if we want to go from row five to row four, my rows should go down by one. So my tourist row should go down by one. And I think that works for me. Tourist row should go down by one. Um, the opposite of that is if I'm going downwards. So this is row zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. So if I want to go down one step, my row number should increase by one. Tourist row plus plus. Leftwards. If we're going left from row five, uh, sorry, column five to column four, so my column number should go down by one to go left. Tourist column minus minus. And the only other option out of those was to have my column number increase to go to the right. Yeah, David and Girachan, yeah, where we're talking about, we could, we could, and, and I do have a very strong instinct to do WASD, but for the moment, I'm going to keep these to variables that we know, because if I had to start reading in characters and stuff like that, it would, it would get a little bit fiddly. I'd have to teach new things here when, when I'm really just trying to focus on what's happening with the array. Okay, so this here takes an input, moves the tourist, but what we might want to do... Actually, I'm just going to take this print map, put it up here, put some space in between these things. Actually, don't need space between those because this is all one thing with the input. This I'm going to put in a loop because if I put this in a loop, um, I'm going to be able to continually move my tourist around and we'll see my, my tourist moving because I don't want to just move them once. I want to be able to like walk around the space. So, let's put a while loop here. And I'm going to grab all of this with control X, cuts the whole lot and control V to paste in here. I'm gonna select the whole lot, tab them in so they're indented properly um, inside this while loop. At the moment, this while loop is pretty dangerous though because I have no condition in here. So this will potentially run forever. So what I might want is another integer here that says um, keep running. And while we're going to keep running, we will keep doing this loop, which means I probably want some condition with which to end. Um, so let's say 
Um, let's let's set up an input for ending the game. Let's just say if I say if I input zero, the tourist doesn't move, um, but keep running becomes becomes zero. So if I um, uh, if I type in zero, the game will end. So now I'm going to keep looping through this. Every time I loop, I'm going to print out the map and wait for input, and then. Depending on the inputs that I get, I'm going to do something with it. I haven't done anything with the minus one or put an else at the end here, but I think this will be okay for now. Let's test this and see how our movement is going. Compile that and run it. Okay, so we've got this. Uh, we've got our grid like this, and my program is just here waiting for the moment. Um, what are people saying? Oh, MX was like, yes, you're remembering that we start at zero. Yes. Girachan, no Easter eggs at this point. Not necessarily. Maybe. All right. I think people are answering all the questions there, so it's good. All right. So let's, let's go up. Oh, hang on. Let me turn off numlock. <laughs> I go up, and my tourist has then moved up one to there, and I go up again, down. Oops. So because my screen is is putting the text right at the bottom there, it means that you can kind of watch it, and you can see me moving it around, like so. So, Nikhil has an interesting question. <laughs> oh, where am I? One of the funniest things about this is, watch this, I'll come back. No, I just went for a little trip off to the side. <laughs> now I'm back, oop, 44. Hey, good, it ignored 44. Um, so yes, our world has no boundaries. <laughs> our world has no boundaries. <laughs> It actually has no boundaries at the moment, which is a problem. <laughs> okay, so at least we've got some movement going along, but we can walk off the edge of the map and... Um, well, at least the program doesn't seem to be crashing when I go off the edge of the map. It's just, like, sort of... It's just lost track of me. It's like this. And I'm not here anymore. But I came back again, right? So there's, there's a little bit of an issue there. Yeah. Um... <laughs> Isaac's like, prove that the flat earth is not true. Okay, so let's press the zero and make sure that worked. Cool, okay, so our, ex our exit value is working. All right, so we've got that movement. Before we go into, like, fully correcting the movement and figuring out all those issues, I want to do one other thing, which is to, um, to track where we've been. So we want to see where in the map we've been. So tracking the tourist, um, I've got the same kind of thing here. Um... I did it opposite. I did not exit here in the slide. So you can see another way of doing it. Um, so what we can do now is everywhere we've been, we're going to mark it in the map as having visited there already. So I guess we can do this after print map. Um, mark where we've been already. So I can say um, map and then I'll go to my, oops, I'll go to my current position. So my current position is tourist R, tourist C, tourist row, tourist column, and I'm going to set that to one. So what that's going to start doing is taking all these zeros and setting them to one wherever I've been. So I can say the, um, the, uh, the positions I've been will be one, the positions I haven't been to has been zero, so it's kind of like, have I visited this before or not? So as I move around, just with this change here, we should be able to see where I've been. Let's run this again and, and see this working. So I'm going to compile that. Did I save that? I think I did, yes. 
Oh, we'll know if I didn't save it. <laughs> okay, so now when I start moving, you'll see this trail being left behind me. And this makes me want to make Snake as an assignment. I realized that I have actually just made Snake. I mean, the hard thing would be like, find the oldest one and remove it. That actually gets significantly hard. So what is the length of the snake? And, um, and which of these should you remove? But as you can see, as I'm walking around now, um, I'm leaving these ones behind me. And I think I set them as one, so they're not going up to two or anything, but they're still just becoming ones for everywhere that I've walked. Um, so we, we're now successfully gotten to the point where we're tracking where the tourist has been, so the tourist is like, I've seen that before. This is like the tourist's memory. Does anyone, everyone just, I mean, like, this is a bad time to talk about this, but people, I remember, like, a million years ago, when I was, when I was a younger man and travelled, um, before the pandemic, um, you'd meet people and they'd be like ticking off different countries that they were visiting. This is what this tourist is doing. They're going around and saying, I've been here, I've been here, I've been here. It's really funny. You go to like hostels and stuff and people are like, oh, I, I've, I've, I've ticked off Germany and then I, I ticked off Norway uh, and then I, uh, I ticked off Indonesia and stuff. And it's like, hmm, did you actually visit these places? Or are you just going in and out of the airport so you can put a tick on a box? Anyway. We'll talk, we'll talk further at a later time about the deeper experiences, what traveling really should be about. Anyway, so now we're tracking where we've been. And that was actually pretty easy because we're just putting a mark on the map to track where we've been. Uh, let's exit there. And, and so now if we're tracking where we've been, we can also check um, whether we reach somewhere that we've been to before. Oh yeah, Rosie's like, I don't have a number pad. Yeah. I, I apologize. Um, uh, <laughs> this only works if you do have a number pad. My my other um, my other laptop that I use doesn't have a number pad either, so it makes it much harder if you're just typing the number in the top. Um, I apologize. I have not taught you characters yet. If you want to, you can try modifying this for characters. But I would suggest you know I'm gonna get there. We're not that far off learning about characters, and then you can modify this later. But for now, just stick with me, um, because I don't want to introduce a new topic during uh, during an example like that. Okay, um, I also had a, a printf here um, for the number pad direction, so maybe I should do that to make it nicer for my user, but we'll, we'll put that back in in a second. Okay, so the question was, the tourist, because the tourist is a very fickle person, Tourist doesn't like to visit the same place twice. So if we've already been somewhere before, the tourist is going to say, I don't like this. I'm going to just end this here. So I'm going to say, we've already been here before. I'm going to make this loop end. So we can add a check here. So we don't want to add the check somewhere in here because I've just set it to one where I am now. But maybe if I do it before I set it to one, I can say that this part of the loop is going to be after I've just moved somewhere. So if I've just moved somewhere and I haven't marked it as somewhere where I've been yet, I can check if I've been there already. Have I been here before? So it's going to be an if statement and it's going to say, um, Oh, I wonder if I want to do this here. Oh yeah, well, I might as well do it here. Okay, have I been here before? If the map at my current location is equal to one, um, let's print F. How boring. <laughs> and then we're going to set keep running to zero to say I will no longer be doing this. The only slight downside of this is we are still going to take input here, but I guess that's okay. We'll live with that. The other thing is I could change the order of these things so that that doesn't happen. Okay, again, okay, I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try this. I'm gonna I'm gonna switch things up a little. So I'm gonna copy this, 
and we're going to print the map initially once. Then I'm going to do this stuff after I move. So that's the end of my while loop there. Yeah, okay. This is going to make things nice again. So what I'm doing is I'm just changing the order of things so that the check of whether I've been somewhere before happens here so that I can't move again. So what I do is I print the map, then I mark where I currently am, and then I move. Once I move, I can go somewhere else, and then I'll print the map, and if I've been there before, I will say, can we continue this game or not? So let's save this, compile it and run it, and see whether this worked. Okay, so we're just gonna go downwards, cross, up, And we think we're exploring new area, but now I'm gonna go somewhere where I've been before. I'm gonna go down from here. And the tourist says, I've been here before. How boring. So now we have the capability to move around the map, but if we land somewhere we've been before, um, the tourist knows that we've been there already. Okay, so how are we? <laughs> Alex D is like, putting the numpad in the chat so that everyone can see what I mean by these numbers. Um, Savesh is saying, is there a way you could move around without hitting enter? Yes, there is, but not with what I've taught you so far. Uh, it gets is significantly more complex into, into how we're going to build things before we can get that going. Um, <laughs> Agira-chan saying, there's no zero in your numpad, Alex. Um... And Miguel's saying, oh, we could do something like a loop counter. So if we wanted to, we could totally do that. So we could say there's a loop counter and we can only travel a certain number of times before our, say, round the world ticket ends and we have to go home, that kind of thing. So yeah, we could totally do that if we wanted to. All right. So now we have our tourist, we have our 2D grid, we have our movement, and we have our kind of scoring. It's not exactly scoring. Oh, you know what we could do? Um, we could, when the game ends, we could say, what's the score? And the score is the number of places we've visited. And so that way, what we could do is calculate our score by moving through, um, by looping through everything and having looped through uh, all of the um, elements of the map, we could count how many of them we've seen. That'd be a really good one for a function, actually. So we could do something along the lines of... Um, I'm not going to write it because I don't think I've got time, but we could do something like int count score and this takes in the same thing as the map. I'm going to leave this one as a uh, possible to do challenge. Um, write a function that gives the tourist a score by counting the number of places they visited after they stopped traveling. So, what was it? Count score. I do enjoy that every time I do this course, something is different from previously. I, I do enjoy that. Uh, in score equals zero. I do this often when I'm um, when I'm writing functions that I haven't uh, that I'm not finished with. I will still write the function so that it works. Oops. Return score. take the to-do out of there. Okay, so a possible challenge here is to do this. You can calculate the score. This will be a good practice, actually. In fact, I'd be tempted to make this into like a lab exercise where I've got all of this 
here, and then this bit just has this bit here for you to do, which is to say, um, uh, can you loop through all of the elements in this and add all the ones together? Because it's not that hard, but it's good practice for like, can you write a double loop? Because there's a double loop here, could you do the same thing, but instead of, um, um, instead of printing stuff out, can you just add up all the values that are in it? Um, okay, <laughs> little aside, but that was fun, I thought. Um, one thing that we can do to make this more readable is instead of one, we can have explored. So we can have unexplored and explored. We can use hash defines here so that when we're working with this code and we're saying um, this equals one um, explored, or we can say set the map to unexplored to begin with, those kinds of hash defines can make things a lot more readable. So we can do something like, oops, I don't know what I'm doing. Define explored zero, define, wait, explored was one and unexplored was zero. So what we start doing sometimes with hash defines is just making this stuff really obvious and readable. There's little things like that can sometimes make our code really easy to use. Okay, so rough completion here. We can move the two rows to track where they've been. Um, how safe is it? <laughs> We've already seen that it's not entirely safe, right? We can walk off the edge of the map. Um, we can... Um, Potentially, if, if someone did start working on Instinct, because they, they played a lot of other games, they'd start, start typing in WASD, um, we, can, we can cause problems like that as well. The WASD thing, I don't think we can fix that quickly or easily, but moving off the map, it could be a problem. So, um, oh, integers that aren't movement, I think we're just ignoring them for the moment, so that's okay, but moving off the edge could be an issue. So couple of different ways we can stop moving off the edge. So one of them is a technique that I showed already when we were doing our dice checker. Any numbers outside the range can get clamped to the range. So we could do something like if we're off the edge, um, we just can't move any further. So the, 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 we actually make it so that the, the, the virtual world has walls in a sense. And that would be this clamping thing um, to say that if at any point we're outside the range of possible values. So the range of possible values of the array is zero through to size minus one, zero through to size minus one. If any time we're outside that range, we get put at the limit of that range. It's exactly the same as the clamping thing we did with the dice checker. So we can put this code in here. And what's gonna happen is if we try to walk off the edge, we'll end up on the edge. So here, I think this is the last thing I'm gonna be able to do because I've only got three minutes left, but it's okay. So I can say stop the tourist from walking off the edge. Now, if we wanted to really lean into the whole circular world thing, we could say, okay, you can walk off the edge, but when you do, you appear on the opposite edge. That's a good challenge. You can, you can try that one if you want. So we have a couple of if statements. So if the, the row of the tourist is less than zero, um, I don't know if I necessarily need an else if here, but maybe. I'm going to use else ifs because I know that only one of these things can happen at a time because I can only move one direction at a time. So I'm going to say off the top. Um... If the tourist row is greater than or equal to, because the number of rows, if I'm equal to the number of rows, that means I am using an index, which is the same as the size, which is off the edge. So that's off the bottom edge, off the bottom, 
else. I'm tempted to not make these else's because this is me assuming that we can only move one direction at a time. If we add a diagonal movement into these, we could have multiple problems here. But for the moment, I'm just going to leave these as they are. So the torus column is less than zero. That's going to be off the left. Torus columns greater than or equal to number of columns. Then we're off the right. Okay, so this is going to check for any of these conditions of me going off the map. And so if I'm off the top of the map, I'm going to make myself stop at the top of the map. So the top of the map is going to be zero. So I'm going to say, if you tried to go past zero, you end up at zero. So that means if we're at the top of the map, and we try to move up, we'll just stay where we are. We're trying to go off the bottom of the map. Um, that means we tried to get to n rows. So this is n rows minus one. If I go down one, that's n rows. That doesn't exist. So I have to stay at n rows minus one. Minus one. Similarly, with the zero, this will equal zero, and off to the right is the size minus one. So what I'm going to get is a situation here where the tourist can't leave the map, which is good because if the tourist leaves the map, then we don't know what's going on. In fact, if I hadn't added this code and I left the map, I think that this time, instead of me just happily walking off the map and walking around, I think that my program would actually crash at that point because I've started marking where I was. If I try to mark a space outside the map, it's going to cause problems. Um, that's like that snake game that I was telling you about that could walk into other parts of memory. Was I telling you about that? I can't remember if I was. This is an exploit of walking outside um, outside memory and changing stuff. Okay, let's try running this because I'm pretty much out of time. Okay, let's make a beeline for one of the edges of the map. So, I tried to walk off the edge of the map here. So I did six when I was at the right edge. And what it did was say, you can't move in that, dire that direction, you stop there. And the interesting thing was we were left somewhere where we'd been before. So this triggered the end state saying that you've been here before, you tried to move somewhere, but you weren't able to move. So that's, um, that's where you end up. Okay, a couple of questions here. In fact, actually we're already over time at 1.02 PM. So, um, yeah, Leon's saying there, because the n row is equal to 10, we only get 0 to 9. So if n row is equal to 10, then we're off the grid. You're exactly correct there, Leon. Okay, so I'm going to wrap up the lecture there. So we've got a, a decent example of a few things happening here. We've been able to create a two-dimensional grid. Um, we we're able to take a set of coordinates like a row and a column coordinate and use that as the position of something. Um, print map we had already, but then we were able to change the position by moving the coordinates around of things and we were able to leave behind some information on this map. And also we have some code here that says, what are our boundaries on the edges of the map? And how do we know when we've gone off that boundary or not? And so we've got this stuff for checking the bounds and things. So there's a lot of this stuff which is really handy general use stuff for for using two-dimensional maps. Um, I'm going to wrap it up there. I will go break mode for a little while and I'll come back and answer some questions. So thank you all. That's the end of the official lecture.
<laughs> I didn't I didn't actually like need to break then for that long. I also realized I did the first hour of the lecture and I forgot to give myself a cup of water, so I've just been surviving. I survived the first half without drinking any water, which is annoying because that's the bit that I talk the most. Okay. Um, any questions? So there's a couple of things there. Miguel's saying, can we use a continue to prevent that from happening? So there are a couple of keywords you can use in while loops um, that will... Um, that allow you to control the loop. We don't use them that much um, because the way I want to teach people loops to begin with is without anything that jumps. So without anything that can jump out of the normal flow of the code. So the keywords allow us to, to make things um, jump to certain points in our code. So continue is a, um, is a keyword that pushes us back to the start of the loop. And there's one called break, which makes us pop out of the loop from wherever we are. Um, I'm not going to teach them or use them in this course because I think that we want to keep to the, the standard of you can follow it line by line. So the only jump is the while loop will repeat. Um, but we always know that that's always in the same place. When it completes, it goes back up. So which is why we are using this sentinel value to leave the loop only when it ends rather than part way through it. Um, however, there are some things we can do. So there's a one there for marking where we've been already. If we wanted this to not end when we bump up against the walls of the world, every time that we go off the walls we could set our current location back to zero so that it doesn't act like it's been there before so we could do that so we're in this position and if we went off the end of the world from here to here so we tried to go off the end of the world we could set it to zero in order to not trigger this and so that we could keep going we could move in a different direction if we wanted to so the option here is to in each of these set the current map position uh, so map tourist r tourist c to zero and then that way it wouldn't trigger this um sorry not to zero to unexplored it's a bit hacky though something about it doesn't feel perfectly elegant to me but we could still do it um, yeah, but that would get us around the fact that bumping up against the wall will end the game. Um, oh, Girachan's asking for for loops. Uh, we're not teaching for loops in this course. Uh, you will definitely see them at other times. They're definitely useful. Um, but they're so similar to while loops as an introductory course. Um, I don't teach them because I don't want necessarily to teach too many different ways of doing the same thing. I mean, there are always, like inevitably with programming, you will learn different ways to do the same thing. Um, but I don't teach for loops because they don't functionally give us any more capability than while loops. I do find that when using them, uh, they're slightly less prone to errors because you'll never forget the I++ at the end of the loop. Uh, which you can in the while loops, which I did, I think, last week. Um, so they're a little bit safer in a sense. But when we, we go back to that idea, so the, the other thing that Miguel was asking about was the break and the continue. They jump the flow. Um, for loops kind of do the same thing where they've got multiple things up here in the brackets, um, which means you can't just read it line by line and have one thing happening per line, which you can with the while loops. So that's why we chose the while loop over the for loop when we were teaching this. Um, oh, Osama was asking if you can use stuff like that in 1511. Yeah, you can if you want to. So if you've learned stuff from other programming, we're not going to say that you just have to forget everything that you know uh, in order to learn what we're teaching here. Um, so long as you're, t you're learning the fundamentals of, um, of how, how to program, from what we're doing and if you learned other programming before you can use stuff like for loops like it's not against the style guide and that's the other thing is go back to the style guide if you want to check if you want to use weird stuff some things will be expressly forbidden and other things will be discouraged um uh 
and other things will be like you use whatever you want so for example snake case versus camel case if we want to get into a massive argument about how we should be separating words in multiple word variables you'll notice i tend to use camel case by instinct they call it camel case because the capital letters at the start of each word look like a hump on a camel the opposite would be snake case which would look a bit like this um you can use either one of those as so long as you keep it consistent we would never use this and this in the same program because that inconsistency is going to lead to people making mistakes um, but yeah, so long as your entire program is consistent, you can use either one of those. So the, the style guide will have suggestions as well as conventions. It will also have in it some places where an arbitrary decision has been made, where it's just like, no, we're just going to do it this way. Um, because you always have to make those decisions when you start a code base, or you start a company and you start working on things. You go, this is going to last through years of us doing this stuff. Um, if we don't make a decision now, we're going to have three or four different ways of this happening, um, all in our big code base that we're using together, and we're going to start confusing each other. So something like four space indenting versus two space or three space indenting or any of the, any things like that, that's an arbitrary decision. It's just been made as a decision. Um, and there's no particular reason why it's better than a different number of spaces. But if we don't keep it consistent, things are going to look weird. So that's the um, um, that's the reason behind those things. And so it's, it's good to start to get to the idea that um, wherever you go, whatever you work on, you're just going to follow the style guide that appears there. Um, and trying to kind of push against the style guide is like saying, I want to make my code confusing to other people, which is like not the way we want to code, right? Okay. So, any other questions? Um, some deeper questions going on here. Miguel's asking about using pointers uh, in the assignment. Um, if you know about pointers, and we're actually going to teach pointers before the assignment's due, you can use them if you want. The assignment is designed so that you don't need them. But if you want to use them, you can. If I remember correctly... Let's see where that takes me. That takes me to lectures, assignments, oops. Uh, where is it? Allowed C features here. Uh, it says here, particularly, you do not need to use any pointers or malloc to gain full marks. If you don't know what these are, that's fine. I haven't told them yet. They will only complicate the assignment. You also do not need to use for loops, and they are discouraged. Right? So, we're saying you can, you can do stuff, but some things are discouraged. And there's also, if you choose to discourage this advice, you're still going to be marked against the style guide. Um, and if you do things in a certain way, core staff may be unable to help you. So if you start using really, really weird arcane programming techniques, there's this word, word called go to that you can use. I think it still exists in C and it allows you to just jump to random parts of code. Um, if you start using that, I'm not going to help you. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> I mean, it, you can do perfectly functional programming. It will work. Um, but whether someone else can actually understand what you're doing or not is a different story. So there will be little things like that. Um, okay, where was I? Back to my code, maybe. All right, let's see if there are any questions. <laughs> there was a potential spoiler there because I opened up a thing and I had a title for assignment two. I should point out to everyone that's not actually a spoiler. Um, that's the title for assignment two last term. So whether or not you're actually getting that as assignment two is still up for debate. Uh, assignment two hasn't been completely written yet. So that wasn't actually a spoiler of it. Yeah, Adam, be happy that you live in an era where, where go to is, is gone. Um, Miguel's talking about global variables. Yeah, we're really careful not to use global variables at all. In, in a lot of the C 
that that we write because it, they're they're super dangerous. Um, if a variable isn't limited inside some curly brackets, it can just end up in places that it really shouldn't be. So some people like to sometimes put a variable here. So int stuff equals one. This variable is now available in this function and in this function and in this function and all these other places. It's very, very dangerous because you don't know who's changed it or where they've changed it or how it's hard to keep track of and you can be relying on it, but then it changes and you're not sure why. So very, very much against using that. Um, it adds, like, if, for some people it looks like it makes things more, more, like it makes things easier for you to work with, but it adds a level of complexity that can really break stuff, it can really, really break what you're doing. So this is, I'm pretty sure it's entirely forbidden in the style guide using those. <laughs> people talking about go to go to is gone go to is not in c anymore i'm not sure yeah oh izzy was saying what's the command with a tilde that allows you to shrink the line that appears in the terminal let's have a look at that so um this is particular to cse by the way but tilde means home directory so if i could do change directory to tilde it will go to my home directory so my home directory is actually this. That's the full um, the full name of my home directory, but I can use the tilde as the shorthand to mean all of that. So when I go cd tilde, my path becomes this, and I can cd change directory to comp1511, change directory to lecture seven. So this home directory, comp1511 lecture seven, is the same as tilde, COM1511 Lecture 7. So this is something that works particularly in the way that we have our file system set up in um, in CSE. And I think this will, does also work most of the time in other Linux uh, distributions as well, is that tilde will take you to your user's home directory. So for me, it's my Mark G directory where I have my stuff. Um, this can be nice for, oh, I don't want to scroll up through all that movement, but um, doing things like your DCC command so they don't go down to the next line. Chances are most of you will have a smaller font size than I have. I like to keep my font size, size really massive for lectures um, so that if anyone's got any lag, they can probably still see the text. Um, and also back in the day when I was on a projector in a room with hundreds of people that you could still see it clearly from the back of the room. Okay. Um, oh, right, right, Miguel, as we we're talking about, yeah, GoTo's not in new stuff, and thank God for that, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Kat's saying, is it okay uh, if you could explain the line that prints the map, uh, line 27? Is writing map printing out the 2D array, and it knows it's the name of an array? Okay, okay, let's have a look. Line 27, okay, print map here. This, as a, as a word that is not in a declaration of variables here, the program is going to look for this word somewhere above it declared, and we see it here. Print map is a function that takes in a two-dimensional array, n rows, n columns of integers, and two single integers. So in order for me to have this function work, I need to give it variables that match the types in the same order that it wants them. So the first variable that I give it before the comma must be an integer array with two dimensions. Now, if I wanted to run this differently and say call this world instead of map, then I would be passing the world variable into print map like so. Um, so that is the way that we would um, pass a variable into that function. So we say this variable that exists in my main can be given to the function. Um, the fact that it was the same name as that doesn't really mean anything. Print map here doesn't magically know that there's a variable called map in here that we're using. This name is just 
the name that it will have inside this function here. So it's nearly like these are newly declared variables that are inside this set of curly brackets. Um, yeah, so I, I hope that's enough information for you. Yeah, yeah, cool. So I think it's like when you see that it doesn't have to be called the same thing. In fact, you can see here really clearly that these are not named the same thing. The only thing that a function needs is for them to be the same type. So for these to be integers, to be put into the integers there, these names for them are the names that they're going to use later. So I'll change this back so that we don't break people's minds when they download this afterwards. Yeah, yeah. So when we had the starter code, it was, um, we had the, um, the, um, the print map function was already part of the code. Um, you could always write a print map function yourself, looping through both things and then writing out the integers is, is something that should be possible. Um, might take a bit of practice before you can do it, but there's some practice here. You can get some practice looping, double looping through, um, through a 2D array if you want there. Uh, Jingyi Song is saying, could you try to open the test screen for paint.c? Um, not sure exactly what you mean there, but I wonder if you mean the 1511 canvas? So there are, I'm going to talk about this on Thursday. But there are ways to, I wonder if I'm using the right command here. We'll see. <laughs> there are ways to run versions of the first assignment so that you can see what's going on. Yes. Okay. Um, I can type lines below and then press control D to see what output those lines produce. Now you're asking me to remember off by heart exactly what happens in the assignment. So I think it is, um, one will draw a line. So if I want to draw a line between say one, one and, uh, five, one, this should draw a line that's a one, one, and it just goes down to, to five, one. So I'll press enter. I actually didn't need to press enter there, but I'll press control D to end that. And this thing shows me that I have drawn a line, a vertical line from one, one to five, one. This is actually part of what the assignment is. I'm not going to go too deep into this right now because we're going to talk about this on Thursday, but, um, I wonder if that's what you are asking about Jingyi there, unless you're asking about looking at the code file itself for paint.c, but I haven't, um, haven't got that with me here, so I'm probably not going to look at that right now. Um, but yeah, this is actually, this is part of what we've done is that we've implemented the assignment in the background and you can actually run the reference solution for the assignment and you can run yours and it maybe in separate windows and see whether they're running the same thing or not. 1511 canvas is a command that allows us to do it in this nice shiny format so that you can see, um, uh, you can see what it's doing because when you see just the, the, the rows of numbers, it's harder to see where the lines are. Um, then we run it like this. So this is one that we've made for you that does some font trickery to make it look nicer. Okay. Another question, Lin Rong Kong is saying, is it okay for C to change a variable to some word, uh, counter equals zero or printf counter. Will the result show the word zero? No, it won't. So soon we are going to start talking about using letters. And when we start using letters, we'll start using words. And so one of the interesting things about that is that each letter is an individual thing, but a word is going to be an array of letters. So we will definitely be able to print out arrays of letters. We will be able to print out words, um, but they won't be an integer type. They'll be of a different type. Um, but yes, we will get there soon. Um, Oh, Jing Yu saying, when I try to compile paint C, it says there's no such file. Um, so one thing that you can always do is if your compiler, if, if when you try to compile it saying there's no such file, you can always check what's in your directory. So you can, you can say, do I see the file paint.c in the directory I'm currently working in? So it could be that you've downloaded the file somewhere or you've copied the file somewhere and you're editing it and stuff like I'm editing here, but I've gone to another directory. So for example, if I go to my tilde, I'm in my home directory here that has all my, my other stuff. And here's my tourist.c. But if I try to do this, 
no such file or directory. You might be getting this same error because you're not actually in the same place that you're looking at the file. Um, so you might want to do a listing, change directory to places, have a look in there, um, and then see where you've put it. If you've definitely lost it, um, you can always just start a new folder somewhere and say, okay, now this is my assignment folder. I don't know where I put it previously, but this is where I'm going to start from. I would suggest to everyone to, like, if I've got my comp 1511 directory with all my stuff in it, like, yours is going to have way more than mine, because you're going to have your labs in there. Maybe you put made directories for your weekly tests and things like that as well. But I would make a directory for CS Paint, for example, or a directory for oops, assignment one, or something like that. Something that makes it easier for you to to find it again um i would i would definitely do something like that yeah so i think that the not being able to find it probably means it's there somewhere and you're not in the right directory or maybe you've downloaded it but you haven't opened it or something like that okay um i think that we are at the end of questions for today it looks like questions are tapering off Okay, cool. You got it. That's great. Um, yeah, so I'll let you go there, everyone. And rather than seeing you on Friday, like normal, I will be seeing you on Thursday afternoon, 2 p.m. Well, I mean, like, it's optional. It's not necessary to go to that one. But Thursday afternoon, 2 p.m., I will still be doing something um, where we probably won't be as long as the lectures because I won't have question time afterwards. It will be question time during, but it'll be a two-hour block where we'll look at the assignment and um, answer your questions. I'll probably talk a little bit about how it's assessed and stuff like that, so you've got an idea about what situation you're in and that kind of thing. All right, I'm going to wrap it up there. Thank you all, and I'll see you soon.